Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Fifth Estate at the Wheeler Centre. My name's Sally Warhaft, and uh, it's um, a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, for those of you that have come regularly to this series, we're almost at the end of our second year, and I was just saying to our guests that this topic tonight of Indonesia is the first time we've repeated a topic, um, which I think is quite interesting given all the things that we've covered in two years, that this is the first thing that's come up that we've felt compelled to go back to um, and have another look. It's um, obviously in relation to the visit last week and the week before Tony Abbott, new Prime Minister, um, it is in many ways, as he said himself, our most important relationship. He's just returned along with his senior ministers um, and at the important level of formalities, the chip seemed to go quite well, very well indeed. Um, what we want to do tonight is find out a, perhaps a bit more about what happened behind the scenes, a bit more of the detail. There's a lot at stake, of course, in the success of this relationship for Australia, perhaps most of all. Joining me are two, well, incredibly well-qualified guests to discuss this. Greg Sheridan, of course, is the Australian's foreign editor. He has analysed foreign affairs for about... Oh, more than 25 years. He's interviewed presidents and prime ministers across Asia. He began his journalistic life, I think, at the Bulletin. Is that right? That's right. Um, but he's been published in the Asian Wall Street Journal, the Jakarta Post, and the South China Morning Post. Dr. Dave McRae is research fellow at the Lowy Institute, and his research is focused on Indonesia. It's politics, conflicts, democracy, and human rights. He's the author of If a Few, of a few Poorly Organised Men into Religious Violence in Poso, Indonesia. So please give them a warm wheeler welcome. <laughs> It was about a year ago that we, we covered this topic, and it was just after Chappelle Corby had been given cle clemency, um, and that was more the, the sort of form we were discussing it um, last time. But Tim Lindsay was one of our guests, and he described the relationship between Australia and Indonesia as schizophrenic. Uh, he said that the Canberra-Jakarta relationship is very good, very strong. It's made a lot of progress, but that outside that small world, the relationship is quite different. And in fact, that there was more distrust than 20 years ago in terms of Australians' perceptions of Indonesia. So I wanted to start by asking both of you um, to, to ref reflect on, on that and if you agree, if you think things have changed, uh, particularly in the last 12 months. Um, Dave, why don't you go first? Yeah, I think that's a reasonable assessment. Uh, if you look at the government-to-government -government relationship, I think things have been good under successive governments. We've seen sort of an institutionalisation uh, of the relationship in annual leaders' meetings, increasing meters, meetings at a ministerial level. Uh, I think there's still a challenge there of identifying common interests uh, sort of at a more strategic level and, and seeing how far cooperation between Australia and Indonesia might go. But then when you look at people-to-people -people ties, uh, they're much less well-developed. And in particular, with the polling the Lowy Institute's done both in Australia and Indonesia, uh, you see lukewarm attitudes in both countries towards the other, perhaps particularly in Australia, and also knowledge deficits, like only 33% of Australians knowing that Indonesia is a democracy a full 15 years after the end of authoritarian rule. Uh, and I think that really becomes a challenge for the relationship because as good as government-to-government -government relations have been, it's one where you frequently have bilateral crises and when you have that sort of lack of knowledge or even prejudice in the community, it each crisis becomes a lightning rod for that and you, you have politicians playing upon those prejudices rather than acting in the, in the long-term interests of the relationship. I think about the same percentage of people think that don't understand that Bali is part of Indonesia too, survey after survey. Greg? I did a radio interview once. Um, I, I won't embarrass the person by saying who it was, but it wasn't the ABC, where the interviewer said to me, why do Australians know so little about Indonesia, Greg? He said, 
Nobody ever goes there for holiday. They go to Phuket. They go to Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> they go to Bali. They never go to Indonesia. <laughs> and I said, yes, well, there you go. That is a problem. Look, uh, I think there, there are three central realities about the Indonesian relationship. One, Tony Abbott is right when he agrees with Paul Keating. And, it's the, and I saw Keating endorse Abbott for this this week. They are the only two prime ministers who have ever said Indonesia is the most important relationship to Australia. This is true because no other nation has the uh, capability to bugger us up if it wants to in the way that Indonesia can. And I can give you 50,000 scenarios in which Indonesians with about as much effort as moving that arm... Give us a couple. Well, they could destabilise uh, Papua New Guinea with a smaller budget than the Wheeler Centre. They could destabilise East Timor similarly. Easily, they could send people across the border in both cases. They could pay militias. It would be effortless, easy as apple pie. And uh, we have security responsibilities for both Papua New Guinea and East Timor. If they wanted to, they could contrive a huge flow of boat people. Uh, they could reinstate the visa-free entry for Iranians and tell their police not to worry about it because it's, uh, they've got a lot of other things to worry about and see how we like 100,000 boat people. Uh, every year and uh, we have a collective nervous breakdown about that. If you want to get really aggressive they could close their islands, they close their archipelagic uh, seas to trade and on and on and on and on. There are just an endless uh, string of things they could do if they ever felt... Inc now there are things we could do to bugger them up too and it's not good, it's not productive for nations to go down that road. But then the other two realities I want to allude to in answer really to your question Sally the two big gaps in the Australia-Indonesia relationship are a, a, a business economic relationship. You need that because when you get the crises that David spoke about, you want very influential people in both societies to be banging on their own government's doors and saying, sort this out for God's sake because I've got you know, $100 million worth of exports. Uh, uh, now, we only have a, a rather small economic relationship at the moment, so that's not happening. Whereas look at the effort the business community puts in to preserving the China relationship, in contrast. And then the final point is this incredible lack of a people-to-people -people relationship. Australians are really missing out here because Indonesia is just so much fun. And I am going to enjoy this period of our new government because this first week Abbott's done very well, but by golly, Indonesia's going to give him lots of surprises and lots of fun. And if Australians only knew what they're missing out, here we watch these dreary, dreadful, tedious European art house films on SBS night after night. Indonesia has the biggest film industry in Southeast Asia. You never see one. The Indonesians are the greatest jokers in the world. And all these brilliant Indonesian think tank figures come and visit us. Do you ever see one on Q&A? Although, God bless Q&A, it, it did a program in Jakarta recently. But the, the absence of Indonesia and Southeast Asia from our life, we pay less attention to Southeast Asia now than we did in Paul Keating's time. And to finish this thought, there are fewer Year 12 students in Australia now in absolute terms learning Indonesian than there were in 1972 when we still had mm. the white Australia policy. We've gone way, way backwards in this relationship. We did invite the editor of the Jakarta Post tonight, but it wasn't... We thought we'd have a go. Um, it would have been... Um, He's a great guy. Yeah, yes. yeah mm. so I hear. Now, everybody... Uh, I want you to respond in a moment, Dave, to whatever you want from mm. Greg has just said. Well, mainly I'd just sound a word of caution on Indonesian film. There are many of them, but pick carefully because they're not all blockbusters. <laughs> it, it's a bit of uh, tasty. Let's get was good. You have to admit that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, you, everybody who knows about Indonesia talks about this lack of... In, at, the, at the popular level of Australian people. But how, how do you c contrive for Australian people to understand another culture as complex and diverse as Indonesia better. Um, and, and on a level that is real. I mean, we're, you know, we, India, you know, people say, oh, there's Bollywood and there's Indian restaurants. I don't know. I don't know how much that helps, but with Indonesia, we don't even have that. How do you confect it? Because that's, that's what is going to have to happen. If, uh, what do you call it? I think if people knew the simple answer to it, it would have happened a long time ago. But uh, I mean, part of the problem is, as you mentioned, it's just not normal uh, for Indonesia to appear in our pop culture. 
Uh, it's unfortunate, for instance, that, uh, well, the Socceroos are in crisis at the moment, but in normal circumstances, <laughs> our football teams are not at a similar level, so you don't have the same rivalry that you have with, say, a Japan. I think they could beat us at cricket at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Quite possibly. Um, but I think you need to get people going over there. Uh, sort of uh, At the moment, uh, I think in-country study is something that's really built up a cater of Indonesia-savvy individuals, but that's a very small set of people. Uh, as Greg mentioned, we have fewer and fewer people studying Indonesian. And I think really getting over there, having some first-hand experience. Uh, we already have very large numbers of Australians going to Bali, but you go to Lombok, even the next island across, and the Australian accents are gone. Uh, once mm. people have that experience, they've got something to, to compare against. So I think, uh, and as you say, uh, it's not happening of its own volition. Part of the problem is uh, when people do study Indonesian, and I've had friends who've studied Indonesian language, and then gone to look for a job and got, oh, hang on, this isn't helping me, and, and sort of left it behind. So until that business relationship expands and there are genuine career options for people who are not going to get interested in Indonesia for its own sake, then I think it's hard to, to build people-to-people -people ties. I, I think it can be done, though. I don't think we should accept a council of despair. Now, in a characteristic Australian way, I'm going to say it's partly up to the government. But you do need government leadership. Keating led us into Southeast Asia and um, was very effective. And Abbott has made a big contribution by making his first trip to Indonesia and telling everybody Indonesia is the most important relationship and taking, you know, a couple of dozen of the most powerful business uh, figures in Australia. That's one thing. Now, over the last decade, a whole series of things happened to make it hard and we surrendered. The Bali bombings produced travel uh, advisories, which made it almost impossible for universities and absolutely impossible for high schools to send people there. That was a real tragedy because without the uh, lure of, of physically going there, it was very, very hard to sell language studies. Indonesia, great language to study because there are no native speakers here to compete against you and it's a much easier language mm. than Chinese or Japanese. But even with those advantages, you can't sell it if you, if you, can't, uh, if you can't go there. The other thing is we don't have a big immigrant population. I mean, we are learning about India partly because now we've all got Indian neighbours and we've certainly all got... Chinese neighbours. The Indonesians are not great emigrants, therefore uh, we haven't uh, learned about them. But without being party political about this, this was a dismal performance from the Australian government the last six years. I mean, we got this white paper talking about Australia in the Asia century, but the Rudd government actually cut out the relatively effective um, program which was promoting the study of Asian languages in Australian schools. It wasn't having a uh, a universal success, but it was having some success. Instead, we got this kind of um, aspirational drivel in the white paper about how we're all going to earn, learn Asian languages over the NBN or something. And, and nothing actually happened for six years. And the actions we did take, suspending the live cattle export trade without giving them any notice, thereby threatening their food security, were kind of hostile. We were very lucky. We had a very pro-Australian Indonesian president. And I wouldn't be entirely sanguine about the future because... The next president is unlikely to be as pro-Australian as the last one. We'll get to that, but Dave, what, I mean, do you, was the last six years that poor? I think uh, basically for a long time there's been a decline in the study of uh, Indonesian in Australia. Uh, the disappointing aspect of the white paper was certainly it set uh, targets for language but not targets that were specific in a politically relevant time frame and back with resources. And so when we've got a new government who've also expressed uh, sort of, I guess, aspirations, uh, policies to increase the study of language, uh, we now wait and see whether resources will be, uh, will be committed to, uh, to match uh, those goals. Uh, I, I recall at the time of the white paper, uh, one particular scholar saying the road to Asia has been paved with reports. And mm. so, you know, we, we really are waiting to see resources committed uh, to give force to, uh, to, you know, you can say a country is a priority, but if you don't invest in the relationship, then it's not going to happen. Mm. Um, let's talk about the, um, the meeting, first the, between uh, Prime Minister Abbott and Susila Bamwang Yudhiyona, um, the formal meeting we we saw it really the the the, the handshake and uh, but what the lead up to that was very fraught um and in fact greg when you sort of talk about fifty thousand things that go wrong i think i heard about twenty three thousand <laughs> possibles um in the week leading up to it 
um, things seem to go as well as they possibly could have, particularly with all that noise in, in yeah, the background. A lot of the noise, a lot of the anti-Australian noise of the weeks leading up to the visit had a few specific causes. Some of it came out of the parliament, which, which has its very nationalist elements, uh, you know, its Bob Catter, Clive Palmer equivalents. Some of it came from Marty Natalagawa, foreign minister, very smooth, nice guy, educated at the ANU. But he's looking to be foreign minister in the next presidency. He's got to establish his nationalist credentials. He's such a westernised guy. Um, some of it came from the fact that Labor has been successful in establishing its legend amongst the uh, Jakarta liberal elite. In other words, the proposition that Labor is more attentive to Indonesia, even though, apart from Keating, it's not really borne out in reality. Nonetheless, Rudd and others have sold that well. Of course, Rudd himself was very popular and well-known in Indonesia, especially amongst the foreign policy Jakarta elite, because he spends all his time at seminars and so on. And during the election campaign, he told them that Abbott's policies were so extreme that they would lead to armed confrontation with Indonesia. I think that's the most irresponsible and grotesque thing I've ever heard an Australian Prime Minister say. And that contributed to some of the noise that Abbott encountered. Also, Abbott's excessive rhetoric in saying that he would implement his policies whether the Indonesians liked it or not. Now, he meant that only in relation to boats turnaround, but it sounded as though he meant it in relation to buying back boats, which is a ridiculous idea, and paying villagers for information, which the Indonesian police do sometimes with Australian money, but we're never going to do it. So all of that led to a good deal of static. The plus was, though, that Abbott knows SBY very well. They've had a lot of meetings in the past. Abbott was health minister. See, Abbott had more ministerial experience than Rudd and Gillard put together, and he's visited Southeast Asia many, many times as a minister. SBY was pretty impatient with the previous government. He had a very good relationship with Howard, and he liked Abbott. So SBY overruled Marty Natalagawa. Also, Abbott did things that SBY wanted. He gave him an absolute guarantee we're never going to help West Papuan secession, ever. We completely um, subscribe to the idea that West Papua is part of Indonesia. That's much more important to Indonesia than anything else uh, that was discussed this last week. So he was able to give SBY some things that SBY wanted. Can I jump mm. in? Uh, so I'll tell a slightly different story uh, to the one that Greg's just told. Uh, I mean, really, I think the coalition got off on the wrong foot. Uh, on the Indonesia front, uh, sort of when they were in op opposition and had talked about turning around boats, uh, this was something that Indonesia had clearly signalled its objection to. Uh, when it appeared they would push ahead with this policy when they came into government, it triggered as sustained a, a period of negative commentary in the Indo Indonesian language media as I can recall in years. Uh, you had really negative opinion pieces in Compass, the leading newspaper there, uh, from uh, admittedly a vocal critic. Uh, one also in Tempo. You had sharp comments from parlamentarians. Very and also, unusual you too. The Indonesian it? Press yeah, in the I, East I, I, no, no, no. study of it. Let me actually. ask this question. Were you reading the Indonesian press in the East Timor period? Uh, yeah, that when, was I, when about I say 5, times yeah, uh, more. okay, so what, if, I'll I'll get to the end, and you you may not feel the need to jump in when I, when I finish my. No, point, I'm just asking. Are, no, are you, sure, are you sure. including the comparison? No, no. I, I, when, when I say in years, uh, I'm not going as far back as that. Uh, uh, sort of. It's unu It was unusual it for was, recent times. Sure, sure. And, uh, you know, uh, sort of, you, even I'll take uh, our guest who, who's absent tonight, uh, uh, Dimas, uh, and in an editorial, uh, sort of, I get in an editorial in his comments overall, he's been very welcoming about it, but opposed to that policy of turning around boats. Uh, and so when the, uh, I think uh, this got the coalition off, on the, the coalition government off on the wrong foot with Indonesia, but... Even leading into the meeting, uh, I think it was clear neither side wanted a prolonged row over this issue. Uh, relations have been good. Both sides want relations to continue to be good. And, and so I think the media, going to Jakarta early uh, in the first overseas visit for Abbott, I think, was a good step. Uh, it signalled the importance of Indonesia, both to Indonesia and the Australian public. And with what had happened uh, in the weeks leading into it, it also... Uh, provided a timely opportunity to move past that row. And in deferring 
uh, discussions on on the policy to a ministerial level, it gives the coalition now an opportunity to quietly drop uh, that policy, which I think is the right thing to do. Uh, when you go on to Papua, uh, certainly an expression of uh, support for Indonesia's sovereignty over Papua is something that has been bipartisan, uh, sort of at least back to the Howard government. Uh, it, it's almost become a ritual that each time there's a meeting between Australia and Indonesian leaders, uh, you have this expression from the Australian government of support for Papua. Uh, I actually think uh, it was not prudent of, uh, of the Prime Minister to go on and, uh, and talk about doing everything we possibly can to prevent and discourage grandstanding. He, he said uh, I will, uh, the Australian government will take a very dim view, a very dim view indeed, of anyone seeking to use our country as a platform for grandstanding against Indonesia. And that's simply not something that the government could or should deliver on. Uh, it, um, what I think it does do is uh, sort of uh, people in Australia have the right to peaceful protest, to express their views, even to express support for independence in Papua. That's separate to the government policy, uh, what the government's policy is on that front. And when you create that expectation that the government uh, will do something about it, uh, you run into a situation like in uh, the UK uh, where you had the independence movement open a campaign office there uh, and Indonesia had the expectation that the government there would close it, which is simply not going to happen. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I think uh, to go to make that sort of statement was a step too far uh, to express admiration uh, for the improvement in autonomy in Papua was out of step with conditions on the ground. Uh, uh, sort of uh, autonomy uh, certainly has increased the cater of elected Papuan officials who are now uh, putting in place policy administering uh, the two provinces that make up what Australians would call West Papua, uh, but it hasn't resolved uh, sort of the grievances of many Papuans and the Indonesian government itself uh, acknowledges that there's a need for a new approach there. And so when we have a statement of admiration that essentially sweeps the existing problems under the carpet, uh, it makes it difficult for the Australian government to engage seriously on an issue that were conflict in Papua to escalate would be one of the things that could would really damage the Australia-Indonesia relationship. Yeah, if I could uh, respond there. I mean, David, you're talking great common sense, of course, goes without saying. But I, I would still say Abbott made the right judgment. He was absolutely conscious of all that. He didn't say he's going to suppress the rights of Australians to campaign on West Papua if they like. Of course they can. But the government is entitled to express a view. And his view is that that campaigning gets absolutely zero support from the Australian government. I think that's very sensible. And um, if you encourage separatism in West Papua, not that, not that you would, I, I'm not accusing you of this, but taking a hypothetical person, if a person encourages separatism in West Papua, what they are doing is encouraging people to get themselves killed. That's what they're doing. It's intensely irresponsible. And it's contrary to Australia's interests at every level. I have become very sceptical about the value of internal autonomy in settling separatist Problems. There are a lot of academic studies which suggest when you have a separatist problem, if you move to a federal structure, you end up with a secession. Uh, I, I think all you can ask for is that the governance structure be the same everywhere within the nation, which in Indonesia, of course, involves a lot of uh, you know, craziness and in, in contradictions and so on. There are lots of provinces in Indonesia where there are human rights problems. It's a very poor country still with very rickety uh, governance measures. Uh, there are lots of people who get killed extrajudicially in India, sad to say. Australia cannot solve these problems, shouldn't try to, and it's none of our business. By all means, we should express human sympathy and solidarity with any victim anywhere in Indonesia. But um, I think it was very smart of Abbott to take that maximal position so that anything that does happen in Australia about West Papua, it's very clear it doesn't have any government fingerprints on it. Um, just a couple of quick responses. Uh, uh, so first, on the, just to take the broader question of autonomy, I think one of the really interesting things that come out of Indonesia over the past decade is in Aceh, at the other end of the archipelago, you had what looked like an intractable separatist conflict, a uh, much higher level of conflict between the Indonesian military and a much more capable militarily uh, separatist movement there. Uh, but a peace deal in 2005 has seen the grant of broader autonomy uh, and much as there are some sort of worrying developments at the moment, what you basically have is a situation uh, where that conflict has been terminated, uh, the rebels have transitioned into, into 
government of the autonomous province, uh, and people really look at that at the moment as a, as a successful case of resolving separatist but, conflict. That was solved not by autonomy, but by the tsunami. As you know, the tsunami changed everything in Aceh. Sure, it, uh, it opened a, a, a period, an opportunity to solve things, but uh, it also, uh, where previously it had seemed intractable, where demands for independence had seemed that something that uh, uh, the Free Aceh movement would never put aside, uh, you then had a willingness to come to the negotiating table. Uh, on Papua and uh, sort of the, the, the issue of saying we will, I don't know if you have the, the, what the Prime Minister then went on to say after the, the bit you read out of, uh, we will do everything we possibly can to, what were the precise words, to prevent uh, we, and discourage? We'll, or, no, uh, we'll take a dim view, he said. Uh, after that, there, there was more. We'll do everything we yes, possibly can to, to stop to stop people. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, uh, let's it, not it, verbal him here. Let's either no, have no, his well, exact words or, or, well, or yeah. not verbal. Well, him. let's defer it for for people can. Uh, the video yeah, is online. Um, absolutely. W- without going straight into that, one of the big problems uh, in Papua, apart from the violence uh, happening between uh, the military and uh, and the part of the independence movement that's armed, uh, and I think a really interesting thing to come out. Uh, as uh, sort of Sydney Jones was here recently and, and highlighted from the World Bank's uh, monitoring of conflict in Papua that only 12% of the violence happening in that uh, is actually between, is actually separatist violence. So it's the most violent part of Indonesia, but there's a lot of other forms. But one of the real problems there as well is that it's one of the parts of Indonesia where people are being imprisoned for peaceful protest, for, for raising uh, the flag that is the, the, the emblem of the independence movement. And that's a really counterproductive uh, step and, and something that uh, within the Indonesian government, I'm sure there are people who would see those sort of actions as counterproductive. So when we appear to also uh, say, you know, we're, we're, we're heavily discouraging even, I think the word used was prevent, but we'll check that. No, no, uh, he, he didn't say we're going to prevent peaceful protest in Australia. He didn't say anything remotely like that. Prevent grandstanding, shall we say. Yeah. Uh, well, but how uh, is the Prime uh, Minister going to prevent grandstanding? Australians well, exactly. grandstanding. So, right, let's, uh, I think we'll all agree we won't, we won't yeah, presume. Sure. But, but what, what I'm saying is that it, it, takes a, it makes it more difficult to engage on that peaceful uh, expression of uh, dissent uh, in the context of the Papua issue within Indonesia. And I think in our engagement with Indonesia, sure, we, uh, certainly Australia should not presume to solve Indonesia's problems. Um, Indonesia would never, uh, set, uh, would never sort of stand for Australia uh, presuming to do so. But in our engagement with Indonesia, what we have to do on many of these issues, there are domestic constituencies or within the government, there are, there are different uh, constituencies. And in our engagement, we need to strengthen the hands of those who are seeking to take a yeah, constructive approach. Yeah, but the truth approach. is we can't strengthen any body's hand in Indonesia. This is a completely mad delusion of grandeur in which we occasionally indulge ourselves. Bad things happen all over Indonesia. Ahmadis get killed, as you know, by, uh, by Muslim uh, mobs. Uh, Shias get killed by, uh, by Sunni mobs. Uh, Christians get murdered in, in different parts of Indonesia. Folks get murdered in criminal uh, in a conflict all the time, uh, all over Indonesia. Australia can have no influence on this. Well, and it, it's, it's, a, it's the road to madness to think that we can, from Canberra or Melbourne, when we've just agreed that we've never had a smaller percentage of our population studying Indonesia ever in our history, when we have a, an anemic and underdeveloped people-to-people connection, when we have the smallest diplomatic service per capita of any OECD country, that somehow or other we can solve the internal problems of Indonesia. Again, I don't think we can solve, but again, to, to, to take a simple example, when last year there was a, a suspicious killing of uh, an independence figure in Papua and uh, suggestions that the uh, police may have killed him in an improper manner, and uh, the foreign minister at the time called for an inquiry, uh, there was, you know... Uh, it was, shall we say, uh, reported in a spirited fashion at the time. But, but I think what that does is it encourages the next time that something happens, uh, there's more of an awareness that sort of uh, this could be something that attracts scrutiny. That, that's not a fundamental driver of the dynamics of, of things in Papua, but it's something that you can do if you're engaging in an open way. I'm going to shift it from Papua, although what, what this part of the discussion reminds me is how difficult Indonesia is to govern. Absolutely. And that there's an election next year. Um, and what are going to be what are going to be the important domestic um, issues 
in the lead up to this election that are most likely to affect Australia or the ones that we have to keep our eye on? Well, the, the, um, the economy is slowing down in Indonesia. People are unhappy about that. Um, the president, although I personally admire him enormously, and he's certainly the most pro-Australian president Indonesia has ever had. Indeed, he may be the most pro-Australian person amongst the entire 250 million people in Indonesia. <laughs> It's, it's a little bit baffling why he loves us so, but God bless him, he does. Do you, I mean, maybe it's worth just exploring a why. Well, he sent his uh, son here for education. He, I was with him um, just after he'd been to see the family of Australian service personnel who died in Nias, uh, assisting Indonesians after the disaster there. And he was very, he was genuinely very moved. Now, in Indonesia, a leader has to deal with a lot of a terrible death, a lot of terrible death. But what moved him was the proposition that there were young idealistic Australians who would die in their attempt to help Indonesians. That moved him very profoundly. His own political career, he's the only Indonesian politician whose own political career has benefited from a pro-Australian orientation because after the Bali bombings, I think on the first anniversary, um, Megawati was president and she wouldn't go down there on the first anniversary. So he was security minister. He went down instead and he gave a very beautiful, very fine speech, one of the great uh, speeches. And it was broadcast in Australia. Mm -hmm. And this kind of cemented a special connection between SBY and Australia. And he got great plaudits for it, both in Indonesia and in Australia. What a wonderful concatenation of circumstances that God should produce that uh, an Indonesian politician on the way up strikes good fortune uh, uh, by being friendly to Australia. But having said all that, SBY is no longer popular in Indonesia. He is seen not to have delivered. Uh, his party is mired in corruption, although there's no serious um, uh, allegation of corruption against him, but his, his own party, the Democrat Party, many of its uh, figures are compromised by terrible corruption scandals. Uh, and He's seen as being an ineffective president. On the other hand, the previous presidents were torn down because they took polarising positions on certain issues. So he's been very, very cautious. He's regarded better internationally than he is domestically. The two, it'll be a very personalised election. Indonesian voters are, are forgiving, but they're not stupid. They want strong and effective government. There are kind of two very interesting candidates. One is Prabowo, a former general with a bad human rights record who promises strong government. And many Indonesians are willing to forgive him his record uh, in exchange for strong government. He would be a challenging president for Australia because he's very, very nationalist. The other leading candidate is Jokowi, uh, the governor of, uh, of Jakarta. Jakarta. He hasn't declared his candidacy yet. He has no known views on foreign policy. He's a nice guy. He'd probably be better for us. On the other hand, he might be a weak president. It won't be an, a campaign decided by issues so much as by personalities and effect. It's not unlike uh, Indian election campaigns, in a way. Yeah, I, I would agree we're heading into what will be a personality-driven election campaign, uh, sort of with the disquiet, with Yudhoyono's performance as president. Uh, sort of the word you hear people use in Indonesia all the time is uh, a successful candidate will be the antithesis. Uh, of Yudhoyono and uh, Prabowo was considered the antithesis of cautious, indecisive Yudhoyono as a firm former military figure. But it's interesting, even when he was the front runner in the polls, his popularity never exceeded about the mid teens uh, during the period that uh, him and the former president Megawati uh, were the two figures uh, people thought might contest for president. Neither of them could really get out of that mid teens range. Then when you had Joko Widodo, always referred to as Jokowi, go from small town mayor in central Java through to mayor of Jakarta, uh, uh, sorry, to governor of Jakarta, uh, the reason he's considered an antithesis is he presents a real man of the people image in his campaigning. He, in Jakarta, he went out to the back streets. Uh, he had a real social media campaign around him. And he presents an image as a problem solver, uh, someone who shows up, comes up with a solution, and, you know, he, he's not been Jakarta governor long enough for people to see uh, whether or not those solutions will be effective. So uh, Jokowi's uh, party is PDIP, the former president Megawati's party. Uh, within that party, she has the sole authority to determine the presidential candidate. 
so although he is now, his popularity has quickly risen up into at least the 30s or higher, he's a clear front runner if he were to get elected. Uh, but it's really up to Megawati to decide. Uh, my impression of the party is that his hand is strengthening, but it all deter it, everything will be determined after the April legislative elections because only then do you know for certain which parties uh, meet the threshold uh, of 25% uh, uh, of votes or 20% of seats to be able to nominate a candidate. Uh, the, the, the one thing that could perhaps not... Jokowi out uh, would be if uh, PDIP, Megawati's party, performed particularly well, uh, she might think, oh, maybe I'll have one more run for president, even though she's lost twice in, the, in the, pro the past two direct elections for president. But beyond that, the fact that it's going to be a personality-driven election, uh, there are some, uh, certainly corruption, uh, sort of uh, one of the dangers for any of the parties uh, is that they have corruption scandals that emerge. And so in just in the last week, you've had the Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court arrested for bribery. So uh, there was already a big focus on corruption in Indonesia. It's been heightened further now. Uh, the other thing, another thing is food prices. Uh, the price of soy, the price of beef, uh, both are salient to Indonesian politics in a way that, say, asylum seekers simply isn't. Uh, and uh, with the restrictions that Indonesia itself has placed on imports as part of its uh, desire to be self-sufficient in a, in a range of foodstuffs, that's seen prices go up and that's become a, a big political issue as well. A tiny, a tiny footnote here, and I agree with everything David said. The one institution in Indonesia which is quite popular is the press, God bless them, because they constantly expose corruption. So Indonesians don't trust their government, don't trust their institutions, but do trust the, the press. How lovely. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> lovely. <That's laughs> um, is there anyone with the... I mean, the, the, the two contenders you've both talked about, I mean, neither of them sound like the, all the love of SBY that you expressed, Greg. Um, so in that sense, it, it, it seems... It, it will be more complicated um, uh, and politically may well be as well. Yeah, I, I think, look, the, the transition here uh, spurred great interest in Indonesia. Uh, I had Indonesian papers uh, asking me to write an opinion piece, asking me for, for comments. I can't tell you how rare it is that the Indonesian press takes that direct an interest mm. in what's happening in Australia. Uh, in the same way, the, the transition and beyond uh, Jokowi, beyond Prabowo, you have people like Abu Riz al-Bakri, a business tycoon who uh, f fronts up the former regime party Golkar. Uh, sort of whatever candidate comes in, it's going to be different to what we've become used to over nine years of Yudhiyono. Uh, I don't think we need to be as pessimistic that they'll necessarily be worse for Australia. I think Prabowo would be a bad scenario, uh, both in terms of uh, where he might take the country if he sought to, to wind reforms back. He is an authoritarian era figure. He has at times expressed uh, enthusiasm for a more guided form of democracy rather than the current democratic situation. Uh, but yeah, certainly there's, there's going to be challenges. We need to understand what the implications are of the different possibilities of the leader. But I don't think we have to assume outright uh, that things are going to be worse because there is, there has been now for, for a good period of time uh, I guess an underlying uh, interest in establishing a good relationship. You saw it even uh, from uh, the Foreign Minister Marty Natalagawa uh, expressing in his meetings with uh, Julie Bishop the, the, the notes of which the Foreign Ministry there leaked uh, that uh, Australia and Indonesia should uh, engage in a stock take of uh, common interests they might have that they could pursue together in multilateral forums and uh, closer cooperation in multilateral forums is uh, I know something that sort of there's been it's an idea that's floated around on our side as well uh, in terms of is this something we could do in things like the G20 uh, that we're both members of uh, so there is that underlying uh, underlying enthusiasm for closer ties, but cer certainly a bad case leader could could make things very difficult David, indeed. David makes a good point there. Um, anything is possible, even a good outcome. Uh, you, we wouldn't <laughs> bet the house on it, but but it is possible. And the two or two or three reasons that David was kind of alluding to are very important. There is actually a growing maturity in Indonesian voters, a growing sophistication and maturity. There is also a really quite developed degree of sophistication and maturity in the Indonesian political class. I mean, when Suharto was first uh, becoming weak and then fell, uh, 
Australian strategic planners were extremely concerned about what might happen, and there were confidential assessments within the intelligent bureaucracy about Indonesia breaking up, Indonesia becoming like Pakistan, going extreme, uh, all kinds of things, all kinds of possibilities. But in fact, the, the political class was was pretty good. Habibi was a better president than we ever expected. They found a compromise in Abdurrahman Wahid, which gave expression to the Islamic identity without uh, without leading them to extremism. Mega Wadi was a do-nothing president, but she had to have her period. And then we got really, overall, a pretty good outcome with SBY. So there's every uh, reason to think that um, there's a good chance that Indonesian voters and the Indonesian political class... The, the one, though, the one big negative is we are in trouble with Indonesian success or Indonesian failure. Indonesian failure would be a disaster, but Indonesian success is also going to be challenging for us because quite soon they will be a much bigger economy than we are and in due course they'll become a significant military power and they'll be less... Our points of leverage over them will grow less, less strong. Um, Other alliances that we've just been talking about the sort of internal dynamics and the things that matter between Australia and Indonesia. But Tony Abbott also, in the past two weeks, met with Mamahan Singh, the Indian Prime Minister. He met with the Chinese leadership. Uh, Julie Bishop met with John Kerry. She met with um, several other foreign ministers. There's been a lot of a lot of meetings going on. What are what are some of the wider um, relationships that might cause tension? Uh, that, you know that are important, to, that are also important, incredibly important to Australia, um, that might impinge on the or, or, or favour the relationship between Indonesia and Australia. Well, the, I think the interesting thing there is that uh, for the whole region, I mean, everyone is looking at the rising competition between uh, the US and China. Uh, Australia is an ally uh, of the US. Uh, the Prime Minister in the Coalition's foreign policy statement is described as our most important ally. Uh, Indonesia takes a slightly different tack. Uh, they have what they call a free and active foreign policy where they're very determined to remain not aligned. Uh, so they uh, pursue a comprehensive partnership with China, also comprehensive partnership with the US. Uh, several days after the uh, Prime Minister Abbott went to uh, Jakarta, you had Xi Jinping uh, visiting Jakarta and, and making a speech to the parliament there. Uh, but, uh, uh, and their, their preference, I think, in their foreign policy is for there to be no one preeminent power uh, within Southeast Asia. And there's, there's an aspiration that uh, you, you will have a peaceful situation there. And much as I think, uh, as I said, they, they are determined to stay non-aligned, they pursue ties both with the US and China, I think there is still a greater comfort uh, as a democracy uh, with the US in, in foreign policy circles overall in Indonesia than what there is with China. And, and certainly the China's assertiveness uh, in the South China Sea, I think, creates disquiet not only for Indonesia, but, but throughout the region there. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. There, there's a lot of contradictory forces at work at the same time. An interesting episode I'd refer you to is when Gillard um, uh, pioneered the uh, annual rotation of US Marines in Darwin, Marty again was at least as opposed to that as he was to boats turnaround and had very sharp things to say about it. And of course the Indonesian Foreign Ministry is really the last redoubt of the old non-aligned movement ideology within the Indonesian government system. But SBY a week or so later just swatted Marty away and said no, 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 we're perfectly okay about it. Because Indonesia itself, uh, perhaps schizophrenic is a wrong word, but it's, there are lots of dualities in Indonesian foreign policy. Indonesia is seeking deeper strategic engagement with the United States. There's a great big program of military and other strategic cooperation, science uh, engagements, all kinds of things between the United States and Indonesia. Indonesia is certainly never going to become a military ally of the United States, but Indonesia does not want Chinese dominance of the Southeast Asian region. And let's be really blunt and politically incorrect about it. The, the fulcrum of much Indonesian politics over the last 30 or 40 years was um, Indonesian indigenous hostility to the Chinese minority. And, you know, one of the insane things about those people who preach that the Chinese will eventually dominate Southeast Asia is just what a rough time the Chinese minority have had in Southeast Asia and how reluctant the ethnic Malay populations ever would be to accommodate uh, Chinese dominance. 
But David is right. Indonesia is inclined to play off China and the United States against each other. Indonesia is attracted to the United States on the basis of values, and values have become more important in Indonesia's foreign policy. I think the previous foreign, poli uh, foreign minister, Hassan Wiriuda, who was a bigger figure than Marty, really, pioneered this in Indonesia so that it now expresses democratic values in its foreign policy. At the same time, Indonesia is repelled by the United States, by the war on terror and the, um, the military intervention in Islamic countries and so on. Indonesia is attracted to the United States because uh, kids love to go to university there. On the other hand, it also is attracted to the money that China uh, pumps into the economy, but it is repelled at China's assertiveness in the South China Sea. Now, there's no relationship that Australia has which causes trouble to our relationship with Indonesia. Our relationship with the United States is an enormous plus for us because Indonesia, because it doesn't have a big uh, diaspora population, has very little uh, clout in Washington. It has very few friends. It doesn't have allies and it doesn't have a, a domestic lobby always uh, in the way that India does or China does. So one of its only real friends in Washington is Australia. So our influence with Washington is an enormous plus for us uh, with Indonesia. So far from being a problem with Indonesia, that's a huge plus. But of course, there are so many contradictions. We have to manage this in a very adroit, sophisticated way to get the best out of it. And I also think we uh, need to be cautious. Uh, Indonesia is aware of its size. Uh, it's had an outward looking president now for a decade. Uh, it has a public who want Indonesia to be able to have more influence on the world stage than what it can exercise at present. Uh, it's not a country that is able to project military force. Uh, it's a country that has a very patchy uh, foreign ministry, some really excellent people, but others uh, not as gifted diplomats. Uh, it's not in a position to be asserting itself on the world stage, but it has that ambition. Uh, it's uh, through its policy of putting ASEAN at the centre of its foreign policy has, uh, is trying to get at the centre of multilateral forums like the East Asia Summit. If Australia presents itself as uh, you won't get on with Washington but for our uh, sort of our assistance, I, that's yeah, not the right no, way. No one has ever no, suggested no, no, that. No, 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 I'm no, just no one that. would remotely ever suggest no, that. I, what I'm saying is that mm. as well as our strong bilateral relationship, the fact that we're close to Washington is a big plus if we manage it Sensibly, look, having influence with the greatest power in the world is a plus in terms of your own national influence. It's particularly relevant to Indonesia. But we've never presented ourselves as a roadblock to mm. Indonesia getting on with uh, quite the reverse. Since Keating, we've been begging the Americans to pay more attention mm. to Indonesia. And just, uh, just on the uh, a final point on the, the, the warmness issue, one of the really interesting things that's happened, uh, maybe not at elite level, but in Indonesian public opinion over the, over the past say, five to six years, is when President Bush was president in Indonesia and we did polling in, in Indonesia, you saw negative public attitudes, really negative public attitudes there in trust in the US to act responsibly uh, in the world. But with President Obama, someone who spent a period in Jakarta in his early years, you've seen that go from about, I think, 26% up to 85% trust in the US uh, to act responsibly. Uh, so, and, you know, that creates an opportunity uh, for... Uh, people at the government level to to pursue uh, greater ties uh, without sort of an overall public backlash that you might have had when when things were so negative. You'll still always uh, within democratic Indonesia have anti-American constituencies, anti-Australian constituencies, anti-Chinese constituencies as well. But at the moment, under the current president in the U.S., that's not a majority opinion. Mm. See, we have the fifth estate every fortnight, so I can just think about what, what um, it's, it's a fascinating, I, I, especially to just this idea of the influence in Washington working hmm. uh, that way. I haven't never heard, heard it put like that before. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, put your hand up and somebody will put a microphone in it, hopefully. Um, you've spoken a lot about Abbott's bilateral meetings. Could you just, um, in, in relation to APEC and the ASEAN um, alliances that Indonesia, uh, APEC, as we know, was where was was um, Indonesia was the host for APEC. It seemed to me, in reading it, that what was happening was that 
China was establishing good relations throughout Southeast Asia and America had sort of dropped out of the picture because A, Obama wasn't there. So could you explain, I think there are trade treaties that have been negotiated, the Trans-Pacific Treaty, and I think there may be another one. Could you explain mm. what's actually happening yeah, and how Australia is doing in terms of being American and aligned rather than... I, I, don't, I don't think there's a simple binary quality like that. Uh, there are two competing trade treaties being negotiated in the Pacific. I don't think any of, either of them amounts to a hill of beans. One includes China and um, Indonesia. One doesn't because its, its liberalisation demands are too strong. Obama not attending was definitely a, a negative for the Americans, but don't for a minute think that China is just establishing good relations around Southeast Asia. The Philippines is embarking on a renewed defence program in order to have the capability to provide a minimum credible deterrent against China, with whom it has competing territorial claims in the South China Sea. The Vietnamese are developing an asymmetric warfare capability which mirrors the Chinese capability against the Americans. They're developing one to use against the Chinese because they have competing territorial claims with the Chinese in the South China Sea. The um, sort of aggression that China showed in 2010-2011, especially in the South China Sea, produced a tremendous negative reaction in Southeast Asia and all of Southeast Asia, with the exception of Cambodia and Laos, ran to the United States for help. Um, American officials told me, the Vietnamese said, look, there might have been a little bit of misunderstanding about Cam Ranh Bay a few years ago, but the fixtures are still there. They still fit American, uh, uh, you know, if you'd like to come back and operate there, that's just fine. APEC and the meeting in Brunei, the East Asia Summit, uh, didn't amount to much themselves, but they never do. Uh, this is, I think Kevin Rudd was brilliant in foreign policy, but one of his big mistakes was he put far too much faith in multilateralism. The Indonesians don't really take it that seriously either. They pretend to have an ASEAN-centred foreign policy, but they're perfectly happy to leave ASEAN behind when they can play on a bigger stage, such as the G20. And APEC and the East Asian Summit produced nothing but hot air. That doesn't matter. Their real purpose is to get leaders in the same city at the same time and force them to have bilateral meetings. Abbott had an hour with Manmohan Singh, the Prime Minister of India. That would have been impossible to arrange without the East Asia Summit in, in Brunei. That's, uh, that's its real value. I think America has gone through a very bad period this last month or two. Footnote on the polls, Indonesia is almost the only country in Asia where Obama does significantly better than Bush. Bush did very well in Asia because most of Asia is not Islamic and has the same view of Islamist uh, terrorists as he does. Indonesia was always a bit different, much more anti-Bush than the others. And of course, Obama has a singular advantage having lived in Indonesia. I myself have met 100 million Indonesians who claim to have been to school with him in, in <laughs> Menteng. But that, that's a very distinct, so that's a great advantage and the Americans should have taken more advantage of Obama. David, to answer the question, yeah. the Okay, well there you go. You, you get two for the price of one. <laughs> on, the, on the two trade negotiations. Well again, uh, I, I don't think it's necessarily a positive dynamic to have uh, two uh, trade agreements that uh, each of them exclude a significant country. I think overall it would be better to have uh, one that, that included uh, the significant players uh, in, in the one agreement, but we'll see where it goes with either of those. Um, I think uh, Obama being absent is certainly a, a short-term negative. It, it doesn't speak well for the governance of the US, but I also don't think it affects the underlying issues that the countries present face in their foreign policy. And it go, again, it goes, you look at Indonesia, uh, they want to be non-aligned, uh, they don't want one predominant power, and that remains the same uh, regardless of, of who shows up to these particular summits. Uh, and uh, just to take on the ASEAN point, I think, sure, uh, Indonesia has uh, aspirations to be influential on the regional stage, on the global stage, uh, in addition to its role in ASEAN. But I've, I've had people there say to me that Indonesia is strongest on the broader stage when it also has a strong ASEAN for, mm. for those multilateral forums that, that they're trying to put it at the centre of. Mm. Hi, thank you both for your insights tonight. It's been really interesting. Um, I've just got a question um, about development policy from an Australian perspective. We've can see from the lead up to the election here that there's likely to be massive cuts to international development and 
even likely no AusAid in the future. I was wondering if you could comment about the potential impact this might have on the Indonesian relationship and our national interests there. Um, well, I'd, I'd say a couple of things. One is, I think, over time, the relationship with Indonesia cannot be driven by the... Uh, and even our aid program in Indonesia cannot be driven by the dollar value of that aid. Uh, Indonesia has a massive economy, big enough to be part of the G20. Uh, our aid, while it's our largest bilateral uh, grant of aid, and we're the largest bilateral grant donor, Japan gives more in loans, uh, to Indonesia, that's a fraction of their budget. Uh, so uh, aid to Indonesia has to be... Uh, not just about a dollar value, but about a technical expertise or some additional thing that, that we're adding to address uh, desires that Indonesia has. Uh, what did happen a bit with the, with the sudden announcement of the cut right at the end of the election, uh, that again fed into some negative commentary. Uh, you had it portrayed in, in one of the opinion pieces there of Australia wants to act like a rich person uh, who gives aid to feel generous. And those sort of statements, once they're made, are, are difficult to rebut. And so, you know, as much as possible, you, you want to try to, to avoid having them said in the first place. Uh, but uh, sort of the other point I'd make on, on the aid relationship is uh, when uh, the foreign minister, uh, then still in, uh, in the campaign, Julie Bishop, spoke at the Lowy Institute, and she coined this term aid for trade, uh, where, where the giving of aid would need to fill, feed into a broader trade relationship. Uh, I don't imagine the government thinks this, uh, but I think in public perception need to be careful that we don't imagine that our aid gives us trade leverage over Indonesia. Australia's trade with Indonesia is very small compared to their overall economy. Uh, our aid, as I said, is an insignificant part of the budget. It's in our mutual interest to expand trade, and we shouldn't imagine that our, our aid program is going to be a lever to achieve that. Yes, of course, Julie Bishop didn't coin that term. It's a very old term, aid for trade. And she certainly didn't mean that, that our aid gives us leverage on trade. What she meant was that some of our aid programs should be directed at things which facilitate trade. And that, of course, is enormously sensible because no country ever got rich through receiving foreign aid. A lot of countries did get rich through becoming successful traders. A couple of small points on aid. Um, they're not massive cuts. There's a cut this year of $600 million. And then, far from cuts, after that, the government has guaranteed that the aid budget will increase by the inflation rate every year for the next four years. Now, I think this is in, in times of great budget stringency. What is very problematic in aid is, is massive changes up and down. And in order to win the United Nations Security Council seat, although that's not the reason that it gave, the previous government massively increased our aid and gave it to all sorts of countries where we don't even have diplomatic representation and can't even supervise that it was properly spent in Africa and so forth. There certainly won't be a dollar cut from our aid program to Indonesia. I agree entirely with David that the dollar value of our aid to Indonesia is insignificant. We give aid to Indonesia for our own purposes. Giving aid to their education system is a good, sensible thing to do in itself. It also gives us some influence and access to their education system. That's extremely good. Qualitative aid, such as seconding Treasury officers into the Indonesian finance ministry and so on, is probably more important than, the, than all the dollars we put together in our aid. Nothing like that will be cut. And of course, we give a massive amount of aid to Indonesia's counter-terrorism effort. There's a splendid facility called the Jakarta Centre for Law Enforcement Cooperation, rather oddly placed in Semarang, even though it's called the Jakarta Centre, which is entirely funded by Australia. It's like a whole university. None of that will be cut. Uh, anything that the Abbott government cuts from aid will not come from Indonesia. But, and this is my final point, when you give a country aid, you almost always earn its long-term enmity. There is hardly a, a case in the world where you can say that the long-term receipt of aid has not produced uh, resentment and disagreeableness in the relationship because it implies an unequal relationship. And we want an equal relationship with Indonesia, which is destined to be a much greater power than we are. So the donor-recipient relationship is one of the least useful frames for Australia-Indonesia relations going forward. Um, a great 
topic for a future forum, though, and one that I'm, I know we're, we're looking at covering. Our time is up. In fact, we're a little bit over time. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much for Good coming time. and you. giving us your wisdom and insights tonight. Please thank Greg Sheridan and Dave McRae. <laughs> And um, just to let you know that uh, the next Fifth Estate, if you haven't been before, it's every Tuesday, every second Tuesday um, evening here. And uh, the next one, this might interest you, Greg, uh, we're going to look at faith in politics and uh, the relationship between, between religion and politics. And we've got uh, Tim Costello uh, and Tim Fisher, the two Tims. Uh, Tim Costello, of course, a former... Um, Baptist Minister and World Vision CEO, uh, and and Tim Fisher, uh, former Deputy Prime Minister and Leader of the National Party. So um, a great topic in two weeks' time. In the meantime, thank you very much for coming and uh, have a lovely and safe evening. Thank you.